first of all, I am absolutely thrilled tonight um, that the Nature Conservancy has come forward and I personally believe in the Nature Conservancy as a very worthwhile uh, conservation uh, uh, nonprofit that supports nature and also in, tries to do it in a sustainable way so that the local communities will keep it going. And I think that's a very important thing. And I've been thrilled that they are willing to have one of their own speak to us tonight about a part of Virginia I have not visited but I only read wonderful things about it and would love to see it, which is the Clinch River Valley in uh, Southwest Virginia. And Brad Krepp is the program director for the Nature Conservancy down in the Clinch River. And he leads the program, which he's gonna tell you about, but it's more than 200,000 acres with forest, nature preserves. Um, and they also are transferring part of the, uh, uh, the property to the Commonwealth of Virginia to, to kind of create a, a corridor here. And so he works with a variety of partners, agencies, local communities, government leaders, business leaders to protect the health of the Clinch Valley and central Appalachian region for both people and nature. He's uh, highly qualified with degrees from James Madison University in anthropology and the University of Tennessee he has a master's in environmental policy and geography. So I'm really excited to hear Brad and really looking forward to what he has to say. Thanks, Brad. Great, thanks, thanks Marlene, I appreciate it. And uh, can you all hear me okay? Yeah, loud and clear. And, and okay, we can see the picture too. Okay, good, good. Well, I'm really, really glad to have the chance to speak with the group and we were talking about at the beginning, um, you know, doing Zoom calls, obviously, I wish I could be with you in person, but I am almost five hours away from Charlottesville. So in a sense, the, the Zoom gives us an opportunity to get together and talk about um, the project here in Southwest Virginia in a way that you know, maybe we wouldn't have done it otherwise. So really, really happy to be here. Um, I guess just a little bit more about me. Um, uh, I've been with the Nature Conservancy for 19 years. Um, most of that time has been in Southwest Virginia uh, with the Clinch Valley program. I did spend uh, several years in the Allegheny Highlands in Bath and Highland County, a little closer to, to Charlottesville. Um, I started the Allegheny Highlands program for us there. Um, and uh, I grew up in Williamsburg, so born and raised in, in Williamsburg, um, but have been in Southwest Virginia um, for almost 20 years now and, and really do love Southwest Virginia. It's a really special place. It's an incredibly important place from a conservation perspective. And the Nature Conservancy has a long history in Southwest Virginia. Um, the chapter, the Virginia chapter um, began work here in the late 1980s, believe it or not. <clears throat> and the first thing we did back then was we bought a small piece of property on the Clinch River um, in a very remote stretch of the river um, that happened to have more uh, types of freshwater mussels than any other place we knew of on the planet at that time. Um, and so from, from that first initial act of conservation, purchasing a, a land around a mussel shoal, um, our program has really blossomed, matured, diversified over three decades um, to now have a really substantial conservation impact and, and footprint in the region. And so I'm tonight, I'm going to share a little bit of that, a little bit of that with you. Um, there's a lot to talk about when we talk about the Clinch River Valley. Um, so what I'm gonna do is spend a few minutes talking about um, the ecological importance of this very special part of Virginia. Um, and then I'm gonna move into some uh, updates for you on some key conservation projects that we have ongoing that I think hopefully you find interesting. And as I move through each section of the, of the talk, I'll stop and see what questions may come up for, for you as we go through this. And certainly we can leave time at the end for, for questions and discussion as well. So uh, starting out, just wanting to show you a map of where the Clinch River Valley actually is. Um, it is uh, what's now known as far Southwest Virginia. That seems to be a, a, new, a new terminology. Um, uh, for, I know for many Virginians, Roanoke is Southwest Virginia, um, but we are far, far South and West of Roanoke. Um, the, the program is, uh, actually a two-state program. So I work really closely with the Nature Conservancy's Tennessee chapter as well, um, because the Clinch River Valley begins in Southwest Virginia, but the Clinch River actually goes into Tennessee. Um, and we work on both sides of the state line. 
Um, so it's a it's a pretty large project area. We've got eight counties in southwest Virginia, all the way out to Lee County, which is the most you know furthest west county in the Commonwealth, um, and into several counties in Tennessee. Um, one of the there's a lot of little factoids about southwest Virginia, and one of the things is that we're closer to I think five or six other state capitals than we are to Richmond. Um, so it is a really distinctive part of the state. Um, and is uh, you know somewhat isolated in many ways, but um, hopefully by the end of the presentation, I'll, I'll have piqued your interest, and and hopefully many of you will want to come for a visit because it, it really is special. Um, the conservancy has been really successful in the region over over these decades. Um, we've protected close to 200,000 acres across the region, and I'm going to break that down for you all tonight and talk about some of the different aspects of the work. Um, but it represents a very large percentage of the overall um, protection work that the, the, the Virginia chapter has done across the Commonwealth. This has been an area where we've made some very, very deep investments. Um, and, you know, the 200,000 acres, is, you know, there's a lot of different things going on. This is a map of the program area with some of the different protected lands. Um, all the little oak leaves that you see on this map uh, largely represent um, properties that we've acquired along the Clinch River, um, primarily to protect its really unique aquatic diversity, especially its really high concentration of freshwater mussels and fish. Uh, the Clinch is the number one river in the country for um, its high, it has the highest concentration of imperiled freshwater species in, in the country, and that's mostly due to the high concentration of rare freshwater mussels. We have 20 20 uh, federally endangered species of mussels, 130 types of fish, um, just an incredible, um, incredibly diverse aquatic system in, in the Clinch River. So we own many preserves along the river to, to protect those core mussel habitats. There are also tremendous places, obviously, to see other wildlife. Um, we see all types of, of birds on the Clinch River. We're even seeing bald eagles make it all the way back over here, which has been pretty exciting to see. Um, uh, you know, water thrushes, uh, kingfishers, ospreys, uh, lots, lots of birds along the river. Um, so we have our river preserves. We've also done a lot of work along Clinch Mountain, uh, which is a really, uh, really wonderful place to go hiking, bird watching. Um, we've put together about 23,000 acres of private lands that we've protected through our forestry program that um, connect to state wildlife areas. So we've created about a about a 50,000 acre protected corridor along Clinch Mountain with lots of opportunities for people to get out and, and see that, that special area. And then our newest project, which I'm gonna talk about quite a bit tonight is what we call our Cumberland Forest Project. And, and that's, that's labeled in the kind of center of the map and is a, the large green area that we show that almost looks like a national forest district. And, and that's because it, it is, you know, it, it is comparable to a national forest district in its size. Um, the property that we protected on Cumberland Forest in Virginia is 153,000 acres. Um, so it, it is, you know, comparable to, you know, one of the districts on the George Washington or Jefferson. Um, and so we've got a lot of really exciting projects going on there that I'll that I'll talk about. Um, the Ed, will you take a breath? Is, yes. Can you point well, out that, on your map Clinch Mountain is? Which one Clinch Mountain is? Is that what you asked? Where is Clinch Mountain? Yes, I was trying to get unmuted. Sorry. Yes. Sure. On your prior um, map. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, if you see the um, the brown and the yellow uh, configuration of okay. protected lands, that's Clinch Mountain. The brown lands are state game properties and the part uh, the those are state forests. And then all those yellow properties are all in our conservation forestry program that stitch together with those state lands along along Clinch Mountain. So all together is about 50,000 acres of protected lands there. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, this is a, a kind of a neat map just to give you a perspective of why the Conservancy is so excited and committed to working in Southwest Virginia. Th this map shows concentrations of rare species, both terrestrial and aquatic. Um, and the, the darkest red areas are the places in the country that have the highest concentration of both uh, species.
species diversity as well as rarity uh, in terms of the representation of different kinds of plants and animals. And so Southwest Virginia, you see, is an absolute bullseye when it comes to being a biodiversity hotspot um, in the region. And if, and if you kind of look more broadly, all of Western Virginia and really the whole Southern Appalachians are, are recognized by the Nature Conservancy as being one of the most biodiverse parts of the country. Um, and so, you know, this is what has driven us over these many decades to find ways to conserve nature, uh, you know, in the Clinch Valley and these surrounding areas, because it, it really is core to our mission to, to be drawn to um, these really special places um, that we, um, that just really matter from a natural diversity standpoint. Uh, and so, the, again, the Clinch is right in the, the center of that, that biodiversity hotspot. And then this is kind of another fun map that um, our, some of our scientists have recently put together, which looks at the landscape through the lens of climate change and species movement and response to climate change. And it's, it's mapping the projected movement of birds, uh, amphibians, and mammals, I think are the three data uh, sources that, that, that were put into this map. But, but if you're seeing the animation, which I hope you are, um, it shows the, the corridors for movement um, expected with changes to climate. And what we've learned and, and what, we, what we feel really confident about is that the entire Appalachian mountain range from Alabama to Canada, um, as you all know, being birders, you, you know that's a really important corridor um, for, for avian movement through the seasons. Um, and, of course, it'll continue to be that way. But because of the relatively connected and intact forested landscapes that we have from Alabama to Canada. And because we have a fairly high percentage of conserved land through that corridor, um, we feel like the Appalachians are going to really present one of the best areas in the country um, to allow nature to be able to actually adapt to a changing climate and to allow plants and animals to move and migrate in response to changing climatic conditions. And so, again, the Clinch Valley and, and the Central Appalachians are right in the heart of, you know, what we deem to be a, a hugely important corridor for the survival of nature as the climate changes. So when we look at the clinch, um, you can kind of think about our work in the clinch in three general areas. Um, the first is forest and doing forest conservation. Um, the temperate forest in Southwest Virginia and on through Western Virginia and across the Appalachians, when you look around the globe and you look at the temperate uh, the temperate ecosystems across the globe, we think the, the Appalachians really are our best chance on the planet to conserve and restore temperate forest systems and all of the embedded um, plants and animals that depend on those temperate forest systems. And, and again, with the Clinch Valley being right in the heart of the Appalachians, um, it's a very important place for forest conservation, migratory corridors, and preserving connectivity for wildlife. Um, so there's a lot of our program that's built around the concept of, of managing forests well, restoring forests, and maintaining forests on the landscape. We also do uh, a lot with freshwater conservation. Again, with the having the highest number of rare aquatic species in the country uh, in the Clinch River, um, here's a you know, collection of some of those mussel species you see. These are mostly uh, baby, baby and juvenile mussels, and uh, the, the woman in that picture is holding a, a more mature purple warty back mussel. Um, uh, a lot of work on freshwater, not just protecting the mussels where they are in the river, but thinking about water quality and thinking about how do we work with communities, farmers, uh, forested landowners uh, around the river to conserve and improve water quality so that the river stays healthy. And then another really important aspect of the work in the Clinch and in Southwest Virginia involves finding ways to make our conservation work meet the needs of people. Um, in our part of Virginia, um, we are, you know, generally um, the counties in Southwest Virginia, um, when you look at, you know, just indicators of well-being, um, whether it's economic or social or health measures, um, we tend to struggle. Um, relative to the rest of the state. And the region is, you know, relatively isolated we have pretty high rates of unemployment. And we're going through a profound transition with the decline of the coal industry, which has really been the mainstay of jobs in, in the economy for 100 plus years. 
So um, all of our programs and our work um, have to meet the needs of nature, but they also have to meet the needs of people. And so I, I think you'll find that thread through my talk um, as we go through the kinds of conservation projects that we do. Um, we always have an eye for how can we make this relevant to our communities? How can we make our conservation work connect with their needs, the way they think about their future and building their own sustainable economies and, and thinking about their quality of life um, and their future? Um, and so that's a big part of how we think about the work. So the nature side of things is obviously uh, front and center, but the people side of things for us is right there as well. And we really seek to develop projects that, that really are wins for both, both people and nature. So maybe I'll stop there for just a quick second. I'm going to go into a few specific highlights, um, just some really exciting projects that we have going on right now. But um, Guy, I don't know if there's anything in chat. Any questions you, you think? Oh would yeah, there's some there's questions. some good questions. Questions. Um, so uh, I think uh, people were are interested in this. Um, Mariana's question that she referred to a map, and um, it was about the there are some things labeled landowner BMPs. Can't remember the last word. And why were they? Oh all yeah, in yeah. Tennessee. Yeah, great question. <laughs> I'll go back to that real quick. Um, that's because we have an incomplete data set. Um, but yeah, what those are, those triangles, those purple triangles, is um, a big part of our program is, is focuses on working with farmers and the agricultural community. And we have a full-time agricultural specialist that is uh, based in Tennessee. And uh, he, he works with farmers and he helps them develop management plans to improve their livestock operations from an economic standpoint, but also improve their environmental stewardship by fencing livestock out of the creeks, building water systems, developing rotational grazing programs. And um, he's done an amazing amount of work. And his, uh, these projects are all projects from his database in Tennessee, um, but there isn't an actual magical state line boundary there. He has also begun to work in Lee County, Virginia, Scott County, Virginia. So we actually just need to update this, but um, we, we're actually in the midst of a, a five and a half million dollar USDA grant putting dollars on the ground, helping farmers with these types of projects. And, um, and, and there should be dots uh, in Virginia as well. That's a, that's a really good catch. All right. And then the other question um, from David, um, was, um, do the California fires show the need for new forest management procedures? Yeah, that's another great question. Um, th the short answer is yes. <laughs> um, the forest systems in California obviously are different than what we have in, in, the, in the Southeast and in the Appalachians, um, you're, you know, Ponderosa, uh, uh, just a different type of system. Um, but I think in both cases, what scientists are beginning to recognize is that, um, you know, uh, fire plays an important role in the maintenance of forest ecosystems. Um, and the frequency of fires and the intensity of fires historically um, varies depending on what kind of forest type that you look at. Um, but generally, both in Western forests and in the Appalachians, um, the records that we have and kind of going back and looking at tree coring and looking at fire scar data and building that that record back in time suggests that fire is, you know, does play a role. There's a regular interval or has been a regular interval of mostly lightning caused, you know, fires that have reduced fuel loads and reduced, you know, the buildup of woody debris in the understory that when it, um, when it builds up to a point can lead to a situation where you end up having catastrophic wildfires. So, um, so we, we are doing a lot of active controlled burning in the Appalachians and out west um, to try to reduce those loads and to try to mimic the historic fire frequency. So there, there are some management needs that we, we feel like need to be implemented to reduce that fire risk. Sorry, one more question did come in. Um, uh, it was, uh, what did the B stand for in the um, BMP, I think it was? Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, that means best management practices, and that that just refers to a collection of um, good practices related to farming um, that that translate into uh, environmental uh, stewardship. So it could be 
exclusion fencing, keeping livestock out of creeks, um, rotational grazing plans so you don't have overgrazing and erosion, um, watering systems to give clean water to the cattle. So it kind of is a catch-all term that refers to these different types of practices that that, are, that we install with farmers on the ground. Thanks for answering those questions. That's, uh, that's it for now, but I, I bet there'll be more. Okay, great. Um, so um, again, there's a lot we could talk about with the clinch with a third, you know, three decade, um, three decades of history, but I picked three things I was going to talk about tonight. Um, I'm going to talk about first the Clinch River State Park, which is an effort we have underway to establish Virginia's newest state park on the Clinch River. It's a very exciting, innovative project, so I want to spend a little time on that. I'm going to talk a little bit about our recovery work with the rare freshwater mussels, and then I'm going to spend the majority of the time talking about our big, ambitious Cumberland Forest project, where we have acquired a quarter million acres of land in the last 18 months, which is uh, a, a area larger than Shenandoah National Park and Acadia National Parks combined. So I'm going to touch on these three, um, these three projects a little bit more. Um, so starting with the Clinch River State Park, um, this is a really cool project that we have been spearheading in partnership with local communities who have formed what's called the Clinch River Valley Initiative, which is a grassroots effort among uh, multiple communities on the Clinch River to promote the river and protect the river as a natural resource and an untapped potential uh, outdoor recreational resource to benefit local communities who are trying to transition again from this decline in the, in the once dominant coal industry to a more diversified economy and one that embraces nature and, and recreation and outdoor tourism as part of a, a strategy for the future. So a few years ago, um, through some some community planning sessions and meetings, the idea was born to try to establish a new state park on the Clinch River. And um, it's been several years, you know, in the making. It's a long process to establish a state park, we've learned. Um, but we developed a vision with uh, local communities um, to do something a little different and innovative. Rather than having just a traditional state park with one piece of property, you know, um, we, we imagine, and the local communities came together to imagine uh, a blue way or a river corridor type state park that would actually tie together multiple communities across multiple counties with the river being the connecting thread uh, and to build a park system that didn't have just one property, but actually had a series of properties spread out along the river. Some that would be large enough to have campgrounds and visitor facilities and trails and others that would be smaller points on the river that would allow people to get canoes in and kayaks in and connect from one point to another through float trips, um, either half day or all day or even overnight float trips. So we dreamed this up with our community partners and the idea caught fire um, with our legislators and um, with the Department of Conservation and Recreation. And collectively, we came to a, a decision that we were going to do this and we were going to pursue a new state park designation. And so over the last couple of years, we've worked really hard um, with our legislators. We've secured um, more than $5 million in funding um, to acquire lands for this new Clinch River State Park. Um, we now have, they have now hired the first uh, Clinch River State Park Ranger, um, and we're working with the state um, to, to basically acquire the lands that are going to be part of this system. And the way it's going to be configured is that, if you can see on this map, you've got three um, orange areas on the river, uh, and then you've got these um, uh, orange and yellow dots that are in between these larger orange areas. Um, and the concept is we're going to have at least two or three anchor park properties that will be spaced out along the river, and that's what these orange properties represent. Um, and they will be next to existing communities so that we can drive tourism and recreation to a place on the river that's beautiful, but also adjacent to a local community that can benefit um, from increased visitation and visitor spending and, and all of that. So. Um, we have, uh, in the last couple of years, we have successfully acquired land around Cleveland, Virginia for a new anchor property. We were completing acquisition of land around St. Paul, Virginia, and then we're moving to Scott County in the, in the next coming years. 
Um, and so these anchor properties are gorgeous pieces of property on the river. This is this is near St. Paul, Virginia. This is a Sugar Hill property that has several miles of the Clinch River that bends around this this beautiful property. Um, this will be the, eventually we'll have a visitor center, um, some flagship trails, uh, and then in between these anchor properties. Uh, the Nature Conservancy is leading the effort to acquire smaller access points. We're building boat launches, we're establishing parking lots, we're putting in signage with information about local culture as well as um, biodiversity, uh, as well as just some helpful information about how far you are downstream and upstream to your next takeout point. But um, we're branding all of the signage with the same logo, and we work with the community to develop this common identity for the clinch. Um, the Clinch's tagline is Virginia's Hidden River um, because we recognize that most Virginians have not even heard of the Clinch, and yet it's one of the most special rivers in the country. So um, we're really excited about this entire effort to um, to raise the profile of the Clinch as a, as a recreational resource through this new state park, but also to help bring business to these localities that really need it and to educate people through the state park system about how unique and special the clinch is um, so that while we bring more people to enjoy the clinch we also educate them about stewardship and the need to protect the clinch um, and so it's you know it's kind of all wrapped up in our vision for the state park um, if you come you know to the clinch now the full-blown state park is not yet open um, we're still acquiring lands and, and have work to do on the infrastructure but many of these access points are open the Sugar Hill property in St. Paul is open, so there's there's kind of a, a you know a phase one um, soft opening, if you will, of many of these spots, and so there's a lot of opportunities now to float the clinch and and see some of the river and tie together some of these access points that will that will all eventually become part of Virginia's newest state park. Um, maybe I'll stop there for just a quick second and see if anybody has a, any questions about Clinch River State Park. Uh, we, we, yeah, we do have one and some sometimes more arrive while I'm asking one, one of them, but uh, uh, are you working with any um, outfitters for like canoe kayak rentals? I think people are looking at that, it looks like a nice place for a float, but don't, they don't want to drag a, a canoe kayak to five or six hours out there. Yeah, that's a great question. And, and yes, that's one of the ideas is the, the park and the increased promotion of the river can stimulate and support local business development. Um, in, in the region. And so we have seen some outfitters, uh, you know, hang a shingle up and begin operating. Um, St. Paul has several outfitters now that if you come to St. Paul, they'll shuttle you to your desired, in, you know, uh, input point, and then they'll pick you up at the other end, um, and they'll help you put together trips, and there's guided fishing tours that some of them do. So, um, so we are starting to see that, which is exciting, and we, we hope to see more of that as this continues to grow. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so uh, I'll talk a little bit now about our effort to, to protect and recover what really makes the clinch unique and special um, and, and, and among all other things. But and that, that is the, these very rare freshwater mussels. We've got uh, 20 plus endangered species. We've got some mussels that are limited in their range to just several, several areas on the river. Um, and we also have a situation where you know, we have seen over decades the, the, the decline of some of these mussel species in terms of their density and diversity. So um, we're involved in a, a very active program um, to try to not just protect the existing populations, but, but to actually restore and expand those populations across the river. Um, and this is just a really cool project that if, if anyone comes to the clinch, we, uh, we love to try to show people um, the process of, of how we um, are building these mussel populations back up. Uh, in a nutshell, what happens is um, we start by collecting um, some pregnant female mussels in the river, and then we work closely with the Department of Wildlife Resources to bring those uh, pregnant female mussels to a hatchery facility in Marion, Virginia, um, where those mussels are able to, to, to grow out, the babies are able to grow out, um, and survive at much higher rates than they would in the wild. Those, those babies then get tagged with, with individual markers and numbers. Um, they're grown out and then they're put back in the river um, 
around. And that's the fun part, you know, uh, is, is getting out there with a group of people and, and placing juvenile mussels back in the river. Um, but working with our partners, we're trying to target about 20, 000, at least 20,000 mussels a year um, that we're putting back in very strategic places within the river to help grow those populations. Um, and, and in doing this, uh, you know, we're also trying to connect um, people with this project through the lens of water quality. And one thing that mussels are remarkable at doing is filtering water. Um, and so we're helping local communities understand that if we can successfully restore these mussel populations, there's going to be a huge benefit to people because our rivers are going to be cleaner and the rivers are sources of drinking water for many communities. Uh, in Southwest Virginia. So um, this is both about the recovery of very unique uh, biodiversity values, but it's also you know, very practically about protecting sources of water for people in, in Southwest Virginia. And with the new state park, we feel like we're gonna have an even better platform um, for educating people about how unique and important these rare mussels are. They've got so many cool names, Tennessee heel splitter, um, Appalachian monkey face, that they're, you know, they're, <laughs> Is, is they're just that each one of them has a really interesting story. And we think that there's going to be a way to captivate more people and build a much broader awareness about the importance of freshwater mussels um, as we build this bigger uh, public understanding of the Clinch River itself and, and its importance. So um, this is another aspect of the program that goes way back to the beginning. We started in the Clinch because of these rare mussels and it continues to be fundamental to our success with the project. Um, and we have a long-term sustained commitment to trying to slowly but surely improve water quality and, and expand these muscle populations through, through this type of program. Any questions on, on the muscles? And then I'm gonna kind of hit our last big, big topic, which is Cumberland Forest. Yeah, there are actually a popular question. Multiple, multiple okay. people wanna know how you can tell a muscle is pregnant. <laughs> that is great. Well, I have to admit, I'm not the best at doing that, but we have some really sharp scientists that, that, that can do that. Um, you know, if the muscle life cycle is fascinating. Um, just the cliff notes of it are that um, every muscle species has a particular type of fish that it needs to attract. Um, and when the, when the females are ready when they're when they're pregnated and and they're they're growing their little tiny tiny little babies that are called glochidia, they reach a point in the life cycle where the the muscle has to attract the right fish, so that it can place those uh, baby muscles, those glochidia, on the fish itself. Then the the babies actually parasitize the fish and grow on the fish gills for a period of time before they drop into the river. So when the muscles are ready to do that, they create these ingenious devices that little lures that, that are little outgrowths from their shell that wave in the water and look like a, a baby fish that they, they use to try to attract the right host fish over. And when the fish comes by, they, they often clamp down on the fish and hold the fish while they release the, the muscles. So when a female is displaying, that means she's pregnant and she's ready to deliver her babies to the right host fish. So um, in some cases, I think they see those displays and that that's a trigger. Um, and then if they're not, I, I really don't know how the biologists find the, the pregnant females, um, but I can certainly try to find out more for you on that one. Uh, yeah, I mean, it might be a question that comes up again. Let's see, we do have more questions about the muscles. Um, uh, let's see, uh, is, is there a concern about increased tourism and traffic on the river that could negatively impact the muscles? That is a great question too. And we thought really hard about that when we we're deciding, are we really gonna go all in on a state park and a big push for, you know, for river recreation? And um, I, I, what we think is that if we're smart about where we put in our access point um, and we don't, you know, direct uh, an access point right into a really productive, important muscle shoal, we, you know, we put our access points in places that are lower risk areas for some sort of physical impact. Um, and we do a good job educating people about muscles and water quality and the need to protect the clinch. We've decided that we are, our assumption is that we will, there's far more to gain in getting people out on the river and raising the profile of the clinch and people's appreciation of the river through great personal experiences on the river and learning about muscles, far more to gain on, 
that front in the in the big picture um, than the possibility for you know very slight potential physical impacts to somebody you know maybe dragging a boat across a muscle shoal. Most of the muscles are buried down and protected from that anyway. So we think that there's a, a sustainable recreation strategy. Um, is a winner. Um, and of course, we have to be committed to, to doing that education work and cultivating that stewardship. But um, we just think we need more people need to know about the clinch because we need a bigger constituency to help protect the river. And we think that, you know, a recreation strategy in a state park really helps us get there. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, that's the way we feel about birding too. It's a way to connect people and make them feel wanting to protect them. Yeah. Um, let's see. So uh, here's one, and I was thinking of this one too, even though it's after dinner, are the mussels edible? Um, muskrats like to eat them. <laughs> so, uh, but, but people don't. Uh, um, they're, they're not, they're not, you know, it's not like a, an oyster, you know, or a, or a, a saltwater um, a mussel. Um, so they're, they're not, they're not really sought after um, for human consumption, um, but you do see, we call them muskrat middens. You see piles of, of open shells on the river uh, often, and, and, and that's muskrat predation. We, we do see that. They were originally used for, for the button industry. Uh, way back in the early 20th century, uh, mussel shells were used to, to make buttons on shirts. Um, and that was actually how a lot of these muscles were first cataloged and inventoried. Um, they would punch out the small circles to make buttons. Um, so that was, the, you know, that was an original human use. But of course, we now have plastic buttons. Uh, thanks. Yeah, and this that that goes along with something David Hogg shared. I'll just read it. I don't know that you need to react to, about about a pile of muscles being left behind. Uh, by a raccoon being an indicator, I guess, uh, that maybe stopped some development because it was an endangered uh, type. Um, mm. Thing. Mm. So, yeah, interesting. I suppose it's one way to find out that they're there. Yeah. Uh, that's all the questions we have, but there were a lot. Okay, great. <laughs> so, probably great. More. Awesome. Okay. Um, Guy, how are we doing okay on time? Uh, just want to make, you know, make sure. I'm moving along. Um, we've got our last topic is Cumberland Forest, which is um, our, our current big, big project. So I've got a few more slides on that, if that's okay. So it's um, 10, 10 till eight. I think we're, we're fine if this is the last section that the, the pace is good. Okay, great. Um, so, so the last thing I wanna tell you all about is, is our Cumberland Forest project. And, and this is really a big deal. Um, this was in the National Magazine uh, a couple issues ago. Um, and it, it really uh, represents um, us taking the work in the Clinch Valley um, to a whole nother scale um, to, to really meet the challenges that the Nature Conservancy sees uh, for conservation in, in the 21st century, which is uh, how, do we, how do we conserve natural systems at a, at a landscape and even a continental scale um, to preserve all of the benefits that healthy natural systems provide, not just to wildlife, but for people, for clean air, for clean water, um, for all these things that nature provides for us, uh, you know, for our own survival. Um, and so again, you know, to the top of my comments, the entire Appalachian mountain chain is really important to the Nature Conservancy and trying to conserve that corridor of forests and freshwater streams and, and natural habitats from Alabama to Canada is one of our top priorities in North America. Um, Cumberland Forest is a big piece of that strategy to conserve the, the Appalachians. And um, so this is a map that shows Cumberland Forest. And uh, Cumberland Forest is comprised of two properties that we've acquired in the last 18 months. The orange property here um, is, the, is the Highlands property in Virginia, and it's about 153,000 acres. And then the red property we call the Ataya property, and it's in Tennessee, right, at, right where Virginia touches Tennessee and Kentucky. Uh, in, at Cumberland Gap. So those two properties together are a quarter million acres. Um, so, you know, one of the probably the top five largest land deals the Nature Conservancy has done in its history. So really exciting for us to be part of it. Um, it's a really unique project. These are lands in the coal fields of Appalachia. And so they have a long history of intensive management and use. Um, 
largely coal extraction and timber extraction. Um, the properties were put together, you know, beginning in the early part of the 20th century by, by coal companies and were managed primarily for coal, you know, well, in, you know, until, uh, well, they, there's still places where there's, there's coal mining on the properties, but the majority of the properties now, the coal has been mined. Um, we're, we're looking at these huge properties as a incredible opportunity to support their transition and improvement in their condition. Uh, and, and we use this triangle to evaluate and think about how we're managing these properties. We want to create wins for nature. We want to improve the condition of these forests over time to benefit wildlife and water quality and all those natural values. Um, but we also, again, we're doing this in a part of the country that is struggling incredibly from an economic and social standpoint. So we want to figure out how to manage these properties to support this region's transition from an uh, over-dependence on coal to a more diversified economy, um, one that we think nature can play a role supporting. Uh, and so there's an economic piece to the, to the way we manage these lands too. So don't think of Cumberland Forest as a pure nature preserve. This is, these are working lands, and we're trying to demonstrate that we can manage a quarter million acres to create positive outcomes along these three points of the triangle, um, nature, people, and economy. The other thing I'll point out real quick is that uh, this is such a big project that the Nature Conservancy has had to develop a new model, um, and it's a model where the Nature Conservancy as a 501c3, is, we don't own the property. Um, this is beyond what the Nature Conservancy and its traditional philanthropy-based model uh, could achieve. We've actually put together a private limited partnership company that we manage, but we have partnerships with other investors. Uh, to, to form the Cumberland Forest Limited Partnership to be able to acquire properties at this scale. So this is an a innovative and a, it's a pioneering effort to try to demonstrate that we can invest in nature and create private investment models for nature conservation management um, that, that are compelling. And we hope if we're successful, we can do other big projects like this that tap into um, not just the Nature Conservancy's resources, but also other investors that have an interest in creating positive outcomes for, for society, as well as financial outcomes. So I'll just run through real quick. There's a lot, lot into this project, but um, the heart of the project is sustainable forestry. Um, most of those 250,000 acres, though not all of them, but, but many of those acres are forests. And um, the forests, the management of those forests are the core of the, the model for this project. And, that breaks into two areas. Um, we do uh, a lot of sustainable timber management, timber harvesting that is certified by the Forest Stewardship Council, which is a third party certification body that ensures that we're doing good science-based forestry that is positive from a conservation standpoint. Um, but we have active uh, timber harvesting on both properties, supporting local mills, local loggers, supporting that part of the economy. Um, and making selections around where to manage timber uh, with the context of the larger properties condition in mind and trying to move tree stands to a healthier condition through active management. We also have a big carbon crediting program where all of the properties are certified um, for, for, as forest carbon projects, and we're actually selling carbon credit to companies that are trying to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions and, and buying certified carbon credits as part of their strategy. We have to, we're audited in our management. We have to show that we are growing more trees and storing more carbon every year. Um, and so in doing that, it allows us to put these forests on a, a longer term rotation strategy and, and increase biomass and carbon storage to sequester uh, carbon and, and help offset greenhouse gas emissions. But, but it also creates an opportunity to help us fund the project through through carbon credit sales. Um, where we don't have forests on the property, we have a lot of former mine lands um, embedded throughout the whole property. This is a picture of a group of us that are standing on a former surface mine site um, that was mined in the early 90s. And this particular area happens to be a place where we are um, partnering with the state to see the restoration of, a, of an elk herd in Virginia. Um, this is a bull elk. Um, this was about a year ago on, on an embedded piece of mine land within the property. Um, and Virginia has an active restoration effort to, to bring elk back to the state. This is in Buchanan County, Virginia, 
Um, I'm actually going out there tomorrow to see Elf. We're in the rut right now. Um, but uh, we see incredible opportunities on this property um, to restore elk populations and support elk tourism. Uh, people are incredibly interested in, in, in seeing elk return to Virginia. Uh, and so there's a big effort here to help work with localities to help support them in their efforts to promote the elk and bring people to the region to, to visit. Um, I also mentioned, I, I, can't, I can't get away without mentioning a, a bird reference for you all. Um, another thing that's interesting about some of these embedded uh, former mine lands that are in a non-forested condition, more of a shrub shrub kind of condition, and often there's some wet areas, but we actually see a fair number of golden winged warblers in those areas. And, uh, and over in another part of our project called Ward's Cove, where we've also protected some forest lands on Clinch Mountain, we've actually found out that we have one of the highest concentrations of golden wings anywhere. Um, uh, you know, there's this interbreeding with, with blue wings, but um, golden wings are becoming kind of one of our signature avian species because we have these, this mixed mosaic of habitat conditions that, that they tend to favor. So, um, it, you know, it's not always, it's not just about big elk. Um, we've got, you know, some really neat bird species and other, and other wildlife species that we think can also be part of a strategy for promoting the region for, for wildlife viewing. We're doing a lot of work on trail systems. We have motorized trail systems on part of the property, which are bringing a lot of dollars into localities. And we're working really hard to um, work with them to improve their environmental management strategies. We're raising funds to, to, to put bridges in where we have stream crossing. These systems were in place before we bought the property. And so we're working really hard to support them, but also uh, increase their environmental management standards um, so that we can really have a first rate system of, of motorized trails around certain parts of the property. We're also doing a lot of non-motorized trail development in former coal communities like Dant, Virginia. Um, we've got grants underway that are establishing new hiking and biking trail loops on around former coal camps, again, helping them think about transitioning and bringing in new ways to, to, to bring dollars into their communities through recreation. Um, we're also looking at potentially putting some renewable energy on some of these former mine lands that are embedded in the property. This is a picture in Dickinson County. Most of what you see is on Cumberland Forest, both the, the foreground, which is a former surface mine site, and in the background, which is mostly forested lands across this mosaic of, of conditions we have on this huge property. But we're looking at some pretty interesting opportunities to repurpose some of these mine lands for renewable energy. Um, and we're involved in a, a, an effort to map the, the entire property in Virginia um, to run some filters to find places that we think will be compatible for renewable energy. And a lot of places where we don't think renewable energy is compatible because we want to protect the forest and other wildlife uh, habitat. So we're really trying to drive the, 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 the view on renewables to these former non-forested mine lands. But there's tremendous opportunities for us to hopefully create benefits for localities if we can work with the renewable energy industry to bring some investment to, to Southwest Virginia and to show that we can cite renewable projects in ways that don't impact the forested resources that we're so concerned with protecting. Um, there's a lot of reclamation that goes on in these properties. Um, there are a lot of former uh, mine lands that were mined in the 40s and 50s before there were even any laws uh, that have left uh, old what are called gob piles or waste coal piles. And we work with, with local contractors to reclaim some of those sites. The picture on the right is a reclamation site of an area that used to look like the picture on the left. Um, but a lot of restoration work is involved in this project. And uh, the partnerships that we're forming around these restoration projects are actually creating revenue that we are turning into a community development fund that we are uh, setting up with the University of Virginia at Wise. So the revenue that can get generated from the reclamation of some of these former uh, coal piles, um, we're turning that revenue into a grant program uh, that will be set up to fund new business ventures and new community development projects in the region that tie to nature in some way. Um, it could be uh, tourism, outdoor recreation projects. It could be uh, forestry projects, it could be downtown uh, revitalization projects that benefit water quality. We're still developing this program, but we're really excited that we're going to be able to 
spin off some of the positive revenue generation from the management of the property back into the local communities to support new projects through, through this grant program. So um, there's a lot going on um, and I don't wanna take up too much time, but it's a really, really exciting time to be working in Southwest Virginia. Um, uh, we are continuing to think about the Cumberland Forest from a very long-term perspective. Uh, and this gets at one of Marlene's comments. Um, as we manage these properties, we are seeking to put long-term covenants on really special parts of the property to protect them and to create public access opportunities and, and open space protection provisions for the long term. Um, so we, we announced recently a 23,000 acre area in Russell County um, with the Department of Forestry is now under a permanent open space easement. We're working on about a 40,000 acre conservation agreement with the state of Tennessee right now. And we're also continuing to look for ways to purchase and protect special private in holdings within this huge footprint one of our top priorities right now is we're working to negotiate the purchase of a uh, of gorgeous waterfall that is on an adjacent property that's surrounded by Cumberland Forest. And we have a landowner that would like to sell this to us to, to put it into a conservation status. And this waterfall actually empties out right into the Clinch River. So, um, so you know, just really, really exciting time to be working in Southwest Virginia and um, uh, we've got a really ambitious agenda for, for our work, um, and we hope that we're, we're trying to demonstrate that, again, the Nature Conservancy can do great projects that benefit our natural world, but also remember the human world and think about ways in which um, protecting nature can connect with economies and the needs of people, and particularly in a place like Southwest Virginia, which is really trying to find its footing um, with a new economy. So. I'm going to stop there uh, and happy to answer questions. I hope I didn't go too long, but um, really thrilled to be able to speak with you all tonight and, uh, and have this chance. So thank you for that. And um, I'm happy to answer questions if, if there's time for it. Yeah, thanks. Uh, there is there is time, I think, if you're willing to do it, because there are a number of questions. People are really interested in this. And thank you. Sure. Um, let's see. Um, so you addressed um, uh, uh, some of this. I think a lot of it really came earlier, um, is the decline of coal opening up opportunity for conservation. And I think you mentioned some of those and how so. So um, I think you covered some, but maybe just to recap and if there were any others that you didn't get to cover. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I think um, the decline of coal has created a, a, a sense of urgency um, that the, the region really needs to diversify its economy. Um, and, and that takes a lot of different forms um, but for us, uh, what we're trying to do is make sure that, that nature and nature-based um, industries have a seat at the table in that conversation. And so for us, that really means thinking about how can sustainable forestry play a role? How can outdoor recreation play a role? How can renewable energy play a role? Um, we don't have all the answers, but our hope is that by managing the Cumberland Forest along you know, that whole spectrum of uses, um, we can help show the region that conserving its natural landscapes um, can be a really smart piece of a future economy, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, let's see, um, there was a question about um, the formation of the mountain range, which are plate tectonics, but whether um, forces uh, shape those mountains besides plate tectonics, I guess, is the question. Yeah, um, well, it's interesting. Um, I guess I'm an armchair geologist, so I'll, <laughs> I'll say that. Um, the Clinch Valley is really fascinating because it's actually the convergence of three totally distinct geologic areas. Um, so on our eastern side of the valley, we have Mount Rogers and the, high, the highest mountains in Virginia, and those are part of the Blue Ridge. And those are really, really old uh, igneous and metamorphic rocks, um, some of the oldest rocks on the, in the, on the continent. Um, the Ridge and Valley, right you know, to the west where Abingdon and Bristol and, and many of the, the 81 quarter is, you know, those, are, uh, those are much younger rocks. My understanding is that those rocks the, the folds and the ridges were initially shaped by the impact of 
of Africa hitting North America, they were in very different positions at that point in time, but it created that kind of, if you imagine pushing two ends of a carpet together, all these bridges and valleys, and most of the valleys have been since, you know, created through erosion more than that uplift, but um, the coal country is Pennsylvanian shale, and actually the youngest geology, um, and there were, you know, swamps at one point in time that were then compacted and the, 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 the breakdown of the plant material, you know, formed that, uh, the, the, the coal the, the, that, that is found in the strata in the, in the younger rocks. So you've got three completely different um, geologies right there in, together in the Clinch Valley. Um, I hope, hopefully that's helping answer your yeah, question. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Thank you. Um, another question came early, and it's a two-part. Um, is the coal mining in the area from mountaintop removal? And you showed some of the surface mining um, after they'd been, you know, like with the elk and stuff like that. So I think you addressed that. Sure. Um, but then the question was, uh, has the American chestnut been introduced at those sites? Great question. Um, so the, the coal mining is a, is a mix um, of surface and deep mining. Um, the, the surface mining is what you think of mountaintop mining, you know, larger areas really disturbed um, vegetation, you know, sort of radically altered. Um, the mining occurs and, and then there's requirements to reclaim and put back material and revegetate those sites. The deep mining has a much smaller surface footprint. I mean, actually more coal over the years has come out of deep mines than surface mines. Um, but you can't see a lot of the deep mine footprint because it's this honeycomb of underground shafts and and, and mine vents, and um, you know, so it's, it's harder to see. But um, so you've got those two different types of mining. Um, the the American Chestnut Foundation has a research farm in Meadowview, Virginia, which is just up the road from where our office is in, in Abingdon, and and they have experimented with restoring chestnuts on surface mines. Um, and there's a big initiative called the Appalachian Reforestation Initiative that its logo is an American chestnut. And there's a feeling that chestnuts should perform well on these reclaimed former surface mine sites because chestnuts generally like drier, rocky, well-drained uh, settings. So there has been some work on that front. We've planted some chestnuts on a few areas um, over the years. Uh, so, but I don't think there's been a systematic kind of landscape scale effort yet to restore the chestnuts. It's still been kind of at the experimental scale, if that makes sense. Thanks. Um, and um, Linda shared that she grew up along the Mississippi near Muscatine, Iowa, where there are once pearl button factories. Pearl Button Museum is there with photos of Muscatine. Muscatine. Oh, yeah. I guess that's yeah. right. Yeah. Um, let's see. I shared a story that I was up there this summer breeding grassland birds on those former service mines. Pretty amazing. Um, Linda yeah. asked, yeah, it's pretty cool. Hey, Linda asked, are local university students and groups involved with the efforts? Like wise, I guess. Yeah, great question. Um, we're starting to, we would like to see that. Um, and, uh, we've got one, one example, we've got a new project, um, that we're trying to figure out how to make it work, but um, there are some biology professors at the university who have uh, a really strong interest in what they call forest farming, which is basically cultivating certain um, commercially valuable native herb species like ginseng, golden seal. Um, and we're looking at a potential pilot project that would look at how you could set up a way to begin to explore um, an, oppor an opportunity for local people to to gather and collect some of these traditional herbs in a sustainable fashion. Um, and some of the students, actually last week I was out with a group of students that were, they're learning the skills of just inventorying uh, the, the certain plants. Um, but, um, and then we've got this new grant partnership with the university that some students will be involved in helping us design that. So we're, we've got some things started, but I think there's a lot of room for, for growth in, in, that, uh, in that area. And we would love to see more engagement with the student body over, over the years as we move forward with this. Well, thanks. I think I got all the questions. There are a lot of thank yous in here, though, and people talking about how they've been a member for years. And uh, thank you for your important work. And um, 
those uh, anyway, just re I don't know if you have time to look at the chat. You might want to. It's just a lot of, a lot of thank yous in there. So um, Merlene right. um, is awesome. Thank you. I think Merlene is going to thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you very much, Brad. Uh, that was really great and does intrigue me even more about I need to get down there once I start traveling around again. And uh, it was very informative about the interaction of nature and people and the economy. Um, and again, the great work that the Nature Conservancy does that you're leading down there. So I can't thank you enough. And um, I do think it would be worthwhile to look at the chats because there's a lot of good comments for you, uh, very complimentary. So thank you. Well, that's great. Yeah, well, thanks everybody. And thanks for the support of the Nature Conservancy. And, um, you know, you all just let me know when things to settle down. If, if you if you want to try a field trip sometime, I would love to host a group um, from from there down down to Southwest. So uh, would love to keep in touch. But but thank you so much for, for the chance to talk to you tonight. Thank, thank you, Brad. All right. Thanks, everybody. Okay, thanks. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.